Thank you for joining Daura Madwarna. Um, we are collaborating here with the University of Malta, uh, the Department of uh, Spatial Planning and Infrastructure. So uh, Sarah and I will be uh, your, your host for the evening. I will moderate the, uh, the discussion um, and we hope to have um, you know, a good debate between our panelists, who I will introduce very shortly, and yourselves as well. So the way uh, that uh, we have organized this this evening is that, you know, we will spend um, a few minutes introducing the topics, and then there is about, you know, half an hour to three quarters of an hour where our panelists will be um, uh, debating with each other uh, on the on the topic. And then we would like to leave about half an hour or so for discussion. So uh, feel free to, to raise your hand digitally and, and then uh, we, will, we will let you in and uh, you can have your say and, and debate even with each other and the, and the panelists. So uh, today we will, this is the second, this is the second uh, webinar in uh, the series on networks of green open space. And today we will be speaking specifically about the social implications of having such, uh, such networks of, of green open space. And even more specifically about the social benefits of participation. So you are all seeing our introductory um, slides over there. Thank you to, to Nina, um, uh, one, of, one of the team at Daura Madwarna who has prepared these for us. And um, whilst we are waiting, we are looking at what Daura Madwarna is all about, no? Um, bringing people together, creating a think tank, uh, looking at the, the nuances really of designing such networks and the benefits that we can get from them. So the first webinar wa was general. It was about networks of green open space generally. And here on the screen, you're seeing some points that were raised. So, you know, what are they? Do we need them? Is it just a fantasy? Um, is it something that really we need to take seriously and integrate into an ecosystem of, of open spaces really um, on our islands? And, you know, where are the priorities? Um, where is the symbiosis between the people and the space? Um, how can we respond to needs? And this is how the first webinar fed into today now. So this is what we will be focusing on, on today. So, I mean, I prepared... Um, I was brainstorming this morning in preparation for, for this evening. And, uh, you know, we keep speaking of the word well-being. It's something which we keep hearing. And it's really, it, it strikes a chord in a sense, especially now, you know, hopefully we are moving towards a, a post-pandemic period. And we have all realized the importance of being able to breathe clean air, to go out, to be able to walk, you know, um, to be able to play in, in, in a safe space and so on. So. I, I think of networks of green open space as having a physical and a social dimension, really, and really the symbiosis between physical and mental well-being is really very important. So there are you know, several papers being written on how just having uh, open spaces really um, reduces stress and therefore reduces crime. It increases social engagement, builds social capital. So there are all these nuances to um, to having these open spaces. And this is what we'll be debating today. So I would like to very quickly um, introduce uh, the panelists that who have accepted to, to be with us here today. Uh, so uh, thank you. Thank you for being here. We have uh, with us, um, we have Cynthia, Devono, Caldon Mercia, and Bernardine Satariano. Well, they were an easy choice, really, because they are all people who are very, very active in, in the realm of, you know, advocating for, for a better built environment and, and really doing really seminal work in, in, in supporting policy, research, um, NGOs, in, in helping, you know, Malta to, to move in this direction. So, you know, Cynthia is a, a self-described change maker. Um, she is founder and CEO of MOVE. It is an NGO. Um, you know, focusing on sports and culture for community well-being. Uh, she's also the national representative for Placemaking Europe and also for Game International. So um, Cynthia is part of Daura Mandwarna as well, and uh, we love to touch base on, on, on these issues. Caldon uh, Caldon um, is a manager at the Valletta Design Cluster um, within the Valletta Cultural Agency. And um, with Caldon, I, yeah, we like uh, debating uh, issues 
such as you know how to be innovative and in where we create open spaces. As you know, the VDC has a beautiful roof garden, and kind of the most instrumental to to its uh, its creation um, and integration into the concept of uh, VDC. So uh, that is something there that uh, will come up. And Bernardine is a senior lecturer in geography. And, uh, you know, those of you who know her, she's very enthusiastic about uh, health and how we can be a healthier society, how our children can be healthier and how our environment can work towards um, making us, you know, helping us, supporting us in leading healthy lifestyles. So what are we going to be asking today? Um, we're going to be asking, I have, well, I have four questions here, but really, I don't think we need to stick to them. Um, I would like, um, I would like you to, to debate, you know, we'll see how this flows. Uh, we'll, we'll keep it, we'll keep it quite, quite flowing. But what I have prepared at least is the firstly, you know, how can green spaces support active lifestyles and also inclusive lifestyles in Malta, you know? Um, we can ask as well, how can people of all ages contribute to the design of green spaces, design based on needs? Okay, we can ask, you know, what role do green spaces play in supporting these changing demographics? We know that Malta, the demographics in Malta are changing, and therefore we can debate, you know, the, what the role that green spaces can play. And also we can ask, you know, can we move towards a cultural shift to prioritize such spaces? So, you know, the motivation for lobbying for such spaces, you know, for, for really pushing to having um, a network of green open space, you know, what motivates to do this? Unless any one of you would like to start off, um, I, will, uh, I will propose, yes, Bernardine, would you like to kick off the debate? Please do. So we, I can't hear you very clearly. Is it just me or? I also can't hear her. No, we can't hear you. So let us see. So before we could hear her. Yes, yes, yes. We met before and we could hear you, but I I don't know. Oh, yes, we're okay. hearing you now. You are hearing me? Yes, yes, that's Good. fine. Right. So first of all, thank you for inviting us and for, for this interesting discussion. Um, yes, I think um, all your questions are, are quite valid and, and quite important in relation to green open spaces. Can I also add blue open spaces? Because that is also, um, I think, important for us being living on an island as well and therefore some spaces relation to the sea are also important as well for this social interaction um, um well in in relation to my research um the role of open spaces is very important for people's well-being um people of all ages um the, the role of open spaces is to provide um, a place where people can socially interact, where, where they can meet each other. Um, and you also made reference to the theory of social capital. Um, and there are various um, political scientists and sociologists who, who refer to this theory and how this is beneficial. And, um, some of the theorists look at it from a human agency and therefore the fact that people would like to encounter others um, with this idea that there is a collective benefit when, when you are, are encountering others. And then, for example, Putnam um, describes this, this theory as a normative and therefore it is part of our norms that we socially interact um, with each other. Um, when, when people interact, they bond. They, you, you meet people on a daily basis, you, you develop friendships, um, you develop to the extent that sometimes if you are in need, you can, you, you can receive help as well. And therefore, that is also something beneficial for you and also for others. Um, however, what is mostly emphasized in relation to social capital is the idea of trust. And if, 
an, an open space is not provided within a community um, and people are not socially interacting with each other, this idea of trust within a community cannot develop. And therefore, um, this is what, what we were hinting and introducing is the fact if we do not have physical spaces, of green open spaces, there is the possibility of, of not enabling um, social interaction and trust with the community. And therefore, the community can suffer because it doesn't have um, a physical open green space um, to socially interact. Um, um, I can go on, but I don't think that this is a lecture. So. <laughs> We can we can pick that up later. I love that you picked up the issue of trust um, because it's it's central to forming relationships. Even just seeing the same people in a space form you know prompts you almost to one day speak to them and 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 get to know them. But you need the space in which to do it. One thing I liked when I started um, studying you know the, the theory of space is that everything happens in a place. We, we kind of disregard to that, that factor that we are beings, there are social interactions, but the place is important because it happens in a place. So this is, this is something that, that is essential. I think, Cynthia, you can really take up the ball here. Yes, <laughs> I agree, Wendy. Um, first of all, thank you, Dora Madwarna, for, for this invitation. I'm, I'm very happy to join this discussion. Um, yes, eventually, um, um, I was, I was uh, thinking, um, last week I was following uh, a webinar by Jean Gabe, I'm sure you're familiar with, with Jean Gabe, and he was saying that uh, we must pay attention to the small ballot, ballots that happen in the streets, so usually when there's a huge performance, you know, everyone is paying attention to the crowd. What are they doing? All the, you know, the fantastic environment that is happening there, the interaction. But then we take, we do not pay as much as attention to the small things that happen on a daily basis in small spaces like public spaces, green spaces. Like even if two people stop to say hi or bonjour or something, that those are the most significant aspects that we should actually um, be looking at. Um, and we, we tend to ignore these, these aspects. Um, another thing he, he mentioned and that set me thinking is that usually the people use the streets because they, they have to. We have to use the street because we need to walk from point A to point B to go to work, to go to school. But people use less green spaces because these green spaces, because they're not so much available, they use them because they want to, when they want to. And I will try to, to give a practical example. Um, well, maybe one a personal experience and one um, of a project we did um, some years ago. So a personal experience is, for example, um, sometimes when I need to go to Valletta and I park my car at the Marsa Park and Ride, um, I would very much want to, to, to walk to Valletta. Um, but, you know, the environment, the space is not inviting. I, I don't like walking in the busy streets. I know that I need to go um, to pass through the Floriana, um, subway and it's not nice so you know automatically i just decide to just get on the bus and drive me to valletta which is not very much not what i wanted to do but unfortunately there there are no other alternatives so if there was an opportunity a green belt a pleasant environment it's just 10 minutes away imagine the um, the impact imagine how many people would walk to Valletta, even if it's just 10, 15 minutes, imagine if they walk just 10 minutes to and 10 minutes back, it's 20, 30 minutes, it's the almost the recommended um, amount of exercise by the WHO. And then um, they, they meet other people, they stop to talk. Um, but unfortunately, um, we I, think it's... I can... Yeah, yeah. And jump in and, and link to what you were explaining. And 
what you were explaining was the fact that there is the need of interaction within a green space and this Ex idea um, it is coming from from ideas and the theory of biophilia where um, from our ancestors we have this hardwired emotional affiliation yes. with its natural objects and therefore um, you feel that attraction and and connection with nature and when you said I will not walk it because it's not attractive yes. that is what was stopping you as well um, what was also stopping you was this idea also in, in relation to uh, when you perceive a place which is not well maintained which there is not enough restoration or, or conservation of it it creates this idea which theorists call um, this a broken window theory where where you see the place uh, uh, yeah. run down with with graffiti with and therefore it it creates this animosity with this anxiety this stress and therefore people do not make use of that place because the feeling that they get is is causing them more stress rather than relieving them in, in on the opposite side if it was a green space um, you are much more likely to experience um, increase in, in levels of tension and um, your, your heart rate is likely to, to decrease and um, you feel positive emotions, you, be, you boost your, your happiness and you relieve your, your muscle tension. So, exactly. so there are a lot of beneficial aspects when you pass from green spaces and therefore the experience is, is related. Yes. To it is. I, 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 I totally agree. And uh, maybe I would like to move on um, um, to another experience we had um, through a project this time, way back in 2017, 2018. Um, Perhaps some, some people um, in this webinar, they, they are quite familiar with this project. We, we organized a project um, uh, in collaboration with the Valletta 2018 agency. It was, the name was Shake It. And eventually this, um, this was about creating spaces for young people in Valletta. So every Saturday evening, we used to go to where these young people used to hang out. I, I believe they still hang out there. Um, which, um, they used to, to be in the area in front of the parliament city gate where Burger King is, I believe. Um, so we used to set up an area where they could play um, street sports, street, street football, basket, whatever. Um, and they really enjoyed it. And they were using this, this space in a constructive way. They were integrating, there, there was an element of fun. Um, uh, and the response was very, very positive, just as Bernardine was saying, you changed something that was perhaps not very positive um, into something positive. Well, I'm not going to go through um, the, the, the issues we had and we had to stop because obviously not, not everyone was very happy, but what I, um, not going back to my argument, what I want to say, if there was a space available that could accommodate as an alternative where these young people could um, spend their time in a constructive, healthy way, um, I, I believe it would have, you know, engaged them in a more healthy activity rather than them hanging out in the wrong, well, I wouldn't say in the wrong space, it's again, because they had to be there because they had no other option. If they probably had the option to choose, they, they never wanted to be there, but there was no alternative. And we tried to actually uh, move out of the space and perhaps use uh, one of the gardens in Floriana. At the time, La Parelli garden was not read yet. Um, but, um, but we didn't have a positive response and you know we were like, um, they told us that we can't use this space because we can't play in the space, which is another argument. Um, but again, closing my argument here is that sometimes um, the people will have to use the space, not because they want to, but because it's what is available. Whereas if we somehow provide an alternative, healthier space, um, things will be different. There, there, there will be more a positive um, and healthy interaction. Well, someone once told me recently, and I found it quite interesting, that 
um, we don't we tend not to see open spaces as having a function, a specific and targeted and prioritizable function. And this is why we don't design more of them because you know we understand the function of a street and therefore it is easy to justify uh, in us in that sense, you know, because you, you you can say, okay, this is why we need it. But we find it hard to pin down and 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 you know articulate why we need an open space because it's more abstract i believe it's you know this, you need the streets to walk from point a to point b but a space why do you need a space i think that's that's the reason behind it maybe with this we can bring in caldon so <laughs> caldon you are you have battled i know with why do we need the the roof garden um do you want to 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 join this discussion on this point of okay, so how do we how do we articulate the function of of, of such spaces to just to simply to make it easier to prioritize even in policy making almost. You are muted, which is the catchphrase of the past two years, and we've said it. Yes. <laughs> okay, that was easy to solve compared to the previous problem, which where I could not follow anything. Um, <laughs> And I'm sorry for having missed, in fact, some of your uh, earlier contributions. Um, <clears throat> but actually, I take that that <laughs> as a kind of cue. Um, it's very frustrating when you cannot join a conversation and when you cannot influence where the discourse is going. Um, and I'm sure we've experienced that, you know, through these um, online platforms for communicating. Now that these are like the main the main tools for that. And uh, the thing is that this this same kind of thing happens when it comes to people contributing to the design of the public space which they use or which is very close to where they live. Um, and uh, and even in that circumstance, it can be very, very frustrating um, not to be able to have a voice in transforming um, uh, the space through your own contribution. And of course, the interaction of your contribution with the with the contribution of other people's um, uh, contributions. So, um, I think one of the <clears throat> important um, phenomena I think that are happening lately in Malta is this kind of increase in awareness of the value of green spaces. Um, uh, I don't think I need to qualify it as a public green space, but green spaces in general, because. Uh, as, as you're aware, even when it comes to, for example, the, the development of urban gardens, which are private, which are still contributing through not just greenery, but they're a green lung to the wider community. And when those are disappearing, there is a kind of um, a, a, a um, something is taken away from the community. So when it is a public green space, then it's even more um, uh, important because it is actually accessible and it is not owned by uh, an individual but co-owned by the community um, so so i think uh, the greater the increased awareness of the importance of such spaces is a big plus now of course it is triggered by a number of things including some negatives that are happening that is the decrease of such spaces the kind of encroachment of private development on on, on public space um, the kind of the, the increased the densification of our urban spaces um, so there are a number of factors, I mean, which are related to, to you know, lifestyles, to socioeconomic development, etc. Cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I, I, I just wanted to highlight that, that I mean, it's a, it's a good start to have greater awareness of, of, uh, of, of the importance of these, of these things for a number of factors. I mean, it's to be able to take your kids to play in, it's to be able to kind of see a tree, at least when you wake up in the morning, at least on your way to work or, or, or in your neighborhood. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, you know, it's if you are aware of the biodiversity that, that is supported by such, uh, by such green spaces. Um, it's a public space where people can just sit and hang out and, and kind of, you know, it's, it's similar to the piazza, no? Um, uh, where, where, uh, where people meet, not because they have a meeting, but because they just, you know, they sit there, you know, like you have the pensioners that go and sit on a bench and have a, have a you know, day long conversations. Um, the, the question that you were mentioning just before I kind of step, stepped in about whether people consider pub, green spaces as something that they can use and how can they, how can they use them? 
I think that is that has a, a historical and a cultural dimension to it, um, possibly tied to our colonial past, where what is not yours is probably owned by the authorities, or um, uh, or you have to make a claim for it, or you have to ask for someone's permission for it. So there are these kind of complicated relationships with uh, with public property. Um, <clears throat> I I uh, I remember um, when I was visiting Japan some years ago. There I was staying in the well. You can't really say the center of Tokyo because Tokyo has many spaces and it's enormous. But let's say it's an area which would be comparable to St. Julian's. Okay, hyper urbanized, very kind of you know, many people um, coming for entertainment. But there was this high rise, and around it, for planning purposes, there was a green space. Um, uh, what was really fascinating, and for me, it was like quite a huge surprise almost, um, is that on Sunday, the this you know um, turfed area was transformed into a public uh, picnic area. So everyone just came. They threw down, um, uh, I don't know, um, um, uh, you know their their bags and their food and whatever and they were and they were sitting there and it was whole the whole day it was packed with people so it's like people took it for granted that this is a public space so i can use it i don't need to ask anyone's permission now of course there's a cultural aspect of course and there's like people have been seeing this happening week after week but there's this kind of attitude you know um, and i think we need to maybe learn yes. how to make use of these spaces yeah in fact, here I want to bring in, um, um, Rafaela has uh, written a post in the chat and she's asking about, okay, you know, let us define participation, let us define community-led initiatives. What you've been describing, Caldon, is something serendipitous, something that, that, that happens or people appropriate the space because it can it be appropriated and then something comes out of it. And we have many of these spaces in Malta. If we look at our waterfronts, for example, we appropriate the space in, in summer and we use it, you know? Uh, and this is where then regulation and, and policy comes in. But what, what Rafael is asking here is, you know, what is the meaning of it? And I'd like to steer the discussion now towards participation and towards, you know, how we can how we can participate as a community to lead to these spaces. And uh, I had a dissert, I was tutoring a dissertation once on, you know, what is the role of policy? Is it better for a place to be unregulated or is it better for a place to be regulated by policy? I don't know if you would like to take this up. It's not an easy question. It's interesting though, because in a country where, you know, um, we tend to gold plate, you know, we tend to over policy in some aspects, um, there is a balance to be, to be struck. And as you know, I'm very interested in planning policy and this balance is something which is, which is critical. So maybe to rephrase the question is, you know, through your experience working with communities, what do you feel is the balance that can be achieved between policy and you know top-down and bottom-up initiatives, which are community-led, which have an element of participation in them? You know, Bernardine, would you like to take this one or, or start off? Uh, we have a problem with your audio. Mm, the pre, I think it's I, again. There seems to be an issue. Let me try it. Okay, there you go. Better. Um, I think what what uh, most of the time emerges from narratives in, in relation to interviews with people is this idea of sense of place, of love of place, um, which a Japanese researcher call, call, calls this topophilia, um, where, where people who grew up within that place and have known that place in certain way, develop this, this love and connection to it. And that is very important. Now, if, if policies have to be done in relation to that place, there is this need of consulting with the public and seeing what the public and the community really needs in, also, in, in order to, to, 
develop a, a bottom-up approach rather than devising policies in relation to what should be done without consulting people who live, who make use of that place, who have a laugh to that, to, in relation to that place, have nostalgic memories, which are highly important for health and well-being. If, if that is destroyed, so for example, if, if we refer to one of my studies in relation to some coastal spaces, well, people narrate how much they used to swim in that place, um, fish in that place, and now it's, it's going to be developed into a marina or, or a hotel is going to be developed. So certain aspects that, that provide a space where a person can develop this, this sense of belonging to that place, which sometimes um, we, we do not think about it as important, but then when it is taken away, we realize how important it is. Um, Therefore, this, this sense of identity of place has to be given much more importance in, in relation um, to, to, to certain policies or, or building regulations and how they should be done. And therefore, the communication with the people who reside in that place has to be very open and, and well communicated. Um, it is important because um, we are planning for, for different groups and generations, for the elderly, for the adults, and also for the children. If, if we as adults or, or the elderly have good memories of open spaces of playing in the streets, maybe now we are destroying them and not leaving spaces for the children. So, so we also have to plan in a sustainable manner and plan for the future generations to, to still enjoy certain open spaces and green open spaces because they are very much needed. Um, policies can also be done in providing green open spaces also in relation to climate change for the future. Um, the presence of trees and, and fountains, they are climate controllers. So, so we are very much aware that we do not go out in winter time because it's raining or because it's windy. And then in summer time when we have free time, it's too sunny. And therefore, um, not providing this, this climate controllers, which are trees, the presence of water, the presence of fountains. Um, therefore, we are stopping people from going out and from interacting mm -hmm. socially on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Cynthia, I'm going to bring you in here. What do you think from your work with, with the communities, from what Bernadine has been saying about facilitating, really overcoming almost the cultural barriers. No, if I understood you correctly, Bernardine. And, um, and, and through design, and here, you know, Steve in the chat has, has written something about, yes, but, you know, how do we respond to the needs, uh, needs-based design approach, if, if I understood you correctly, Steve. Um, you know, how do, we inter how do we design for spaces that are responsive to people's needs. And I know you have worked extensively with, with many different people, Cynthia. Yes, um, indeed. Um, I, I think that um, usually uh, planners and policy makers um, make this mistake that they, okay, they say, okay, we are designing the space for the people, but then they forgot, forget to include the people, the users. So I think we design for the people, but not with the people. Um, and that's a huge mistake, in my opinion, because usually uh, the users are involved at a later stage, when sometimes it's a little bit too late. So I think, um, well, it is very important to involve, well, say, well the community, um, the, the people, the users, um, at the beginning, at the beginning um, phase, when, I mean, because the planners are not going to use the space um, uh, eventually. Um, uh, so yes, I, I, I believe that's a, a, um, a key issue when designing, when designing space. And just as Bernadine was saying, um, when you're discussing and consulting with the community, with the people who lived there, there, there might be things that they are um, close to the hearts, they, 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 they have a very strong sense of belonging, so that's important. Um, as well, the young people and children, they have different needs, so you can't, you have to cater for different ages, different abilities, um, and different perhaps cultural realities as well. 
So yeah, I believe the way forward is designing with the people and not for the people. Yes, in fact, Noel here is saying sort of, is there an understanding of what the local communities want? And this is this is what Raffaella referred to in, in when she was saying about local traditional knowledge. Yes, you know, there is there is something about uh, accessing this big body of knowledge that is there and we, with, with our own personal realities, we might not have access to, uh, you know, you have you have your, your bubble in a sense. And therefore, how to how to move into uh, I know this image in my head of uh, my daughter blowing uh, soap bubbles and joining up. How do we form, you know, a more interesting set of bubbles to, to grow this 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 big body of knowledge? Ekaldon, do you want to bring in here your experience with the the VDC on on how, you know, what worked, some best practice maybe, some best practice pointers as to what what works in trying to understand a community when you have a project, uh, you know? Yeah. Um, um... Well, this is kind of linked to the comment I just put um, on the chat in, in reply to Rafael's provocation, which I think is very valid. Um, um, I think there's there's a risk that policymakers try to jump or skip straight to the solutions, which they presuppose are, you know, um, uh, the most valid kind of ways of tackling uh, issues that they are facing, um, rather than develop, rather than engaging with the community, so that um public resources are used to develop a platform which the community then can take forward to develop its own solutions for itself collectively of course still in touch with policymakers etc so in the case of the garden at the cluster i mean the suggestion came from the public through a consultation process which meant that we had to change the public the 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 planning authority application and therefore, if you're open for consultation, be ready to change or to take in some suggestions. Not, not all the suggestions you can take in because some of them are incompatible with each other. But at least within the main line of the mission that you've set yourself, if there are valid suggestions, I think you, you need to be ready to change. So that's one thing. Secondly, um, there are various ways of develop, developing platforms. I like to say, when we, when we have meetings with, I don't know, students or people visiting the cluster that we serve as a platform, but platforms are new, not neutral spaces. There are different ways of designing platforms. You can design platforms so that you preserve the individuality of the different users and there is very little interaction. While you can design platforms which promote and encourage um, that type of interaction. And, uh, and I think by creating for example, with the design cluster, but it's not the only the only example that can be given. But by creating a space, a public a publicly accessible space, which does not need an um, any payment directly or indirectly, because you need to you know you feel that you're obliged to buy a coffee from the cafe to be able to sit in that area. Okay, um, so so it's publicly accessible, um, uh, and that. That's one thing, okay, that is accessible and it's accessible both um, both, both in, in the real sense and in a perceived sense. Um, that's one thing. And the, and the other one is that you don't think that just by creating the space, you've solved the problem or that people are going to start engaging, you know, straight away. It's, a, it's an ongoing thing. And, it's a, and because of the challenges that we mentioned earlier, you know, that people might not feel comfortable stepping into the space because people do not have that even personal you know, baggage of familiarity with that locality, as Bernardin, Bernardine was mentioning, you know, like they don't have the familiarity, they don't feel kind of entitled to enter that space. For example, in our, in our case, you know, the, uh, and quite a few elderly people who used to live in the cluster, who used to live in the old Bicharia before, um, uh, they came to see, first of all, where they, where they were born or where they used to live with their nana or whatever. But then they went to, on the roof, you know, I felt a different attitude from these people compared to people who are just visiting because it just happens to be publicly accessible. You know, mm -hmm. these mm -hmm. kind of people came in to actually see how the space has transformed. They already have an attachment before they've seen the space, even though it's radically changed. But uh, there's there's only so much you can change in a space when people have you know decades of memories associated to it. So they they can always like see with x-rays eyes almost you know that space so there's that attachment and i think 
in our case, we, we, we need to build on that because that's a huge social, you know, um, plus, um, a, a, a huge social potential that we can build on. That there is, a, there is an existing community which is dispersed, completely dispersed, that doesn't really exist in one physical space now because most of these people have left Valletta, they live in other neighborhoods, even if they live in Valletta. Um, they, they are elderly, so they, you know, it, it has thinned out, let's say, the crowd that they used to hang out with. But, um, but it's a start. And, um, and I think taking that kind of positive, that asset that the community already has, and use it to see how you can make a public space more relevant for that community and for others then, because that, that's the inclusion. Inclusion is not like a declaration you, that you put in your mission statement. It's a, it's a constant day after day kind of process. Um, and there, there are setbacks and there are kind of days when you win small, small victories, you know? So, so it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a process. In fact, I mean, you're reminding me very much of the, um, you know, really our identity as linked to open space, Caldon, really in a sense, and I'm finding it hard to phrase it. Do we see ourselves as people who use such spaces? And then Danny in the chat has said sort of, you know, uh, is it lost from collective memory? This, our, our identity of being in an open space, you know, are our children, are the younger generation not having that experience and therefore not identifying with it and therefore not, not prioritizing it and will not pass, on, pass it on to other generations? Is it something that uh, this lack of familiarity, especially when we're young, is it being is it being lost? I really like your comment, Danny, in because it's it's a real thing. Um, we are we we have lost maybe an element of open space, you know, attached to our homes, and we are slowly, you know, there is the fear of losing even the open space which is beyond um, our homes because of the densification of the built environment, and this is something important. So how can we? Relink our identity to to not being afraid almost of being in open spaces. I have a project at the moment I'm going with children, and the key issue that they mentioned, and Bernardine here you might have experienced, is security, safety. So maybe as parents we tend to uh, really be really too fixated on the issue of are they safe and should we leave them alone in this this open space? Will they be safe alone? I don't know if you want to pick up on that. I get the audio. Can you hear me now? Mm. Yes, good. Yeah. Um, uh, yes, I mean, um, it's, it's very much connected with what um, my children that I, I conducted the project with pointed out. Um, however, this also links to this idea of trust as well. Um, and also yeah. what is the children pointed out are feelings of inequality, which are really harming their, their well-being, in the sense that um, children are pointing out why are cars treated as more important than my play in the street? Um, sometimes not well-maintained spaces are also creating low self-esteem because, um, for example, they are afraid to tell their friends where they live because they live in a place where it, which is run down. So it is not their house, which is not well maintained, but it is the environment which creates them stress and anxiety that they do not want to share with other um, friends that, that they have. Um, and therefore, I think we are we are failing if, if we do not invest very well in, in green open spaces and, and providing and keeping it there. Because even for us, if it is if it stopped 10 years ago, we, we cannot continue that sense of identity that is also very much important for us. Um, and stopping it from future generations is also um, hindering them from enjoying a positive well-being, a positive experience of, of place. And um, creating these feelings of inequalities is highly damaging. And also, if we create stigma in relation to certain um, spaces, that, that those places are not well maintained or, or certain things are more of a priority than the needs of children. 
Mm -hmm. um, these are all, all very harmful in relation to the future generation. And, and also, I don't know if it was um, Denny's comment, but yes, it is very important that we continue to consult with, with children and with different generations. And therefore, it shouldn't be one consultation, but it should be a longitudinal consultation. And that um, space can be shaped according to the different generations ac across time, across the different needs. Etc. So, mm -hmm. um, yes, yes, it's very important. In fact, Steve brought it up, and uh, this is something Steve and I have discussed an, at length. Um, in that, you know, what is consultation, and um, how can we almost uh, look before a change in the process so that the consultation is not only legal but it's legitimate? It is consultation which is truly representative, and we can widen the debate to a you know, debate on democracy itself, but we can narrow it down, if we like, into mm -hmm. something which is applicable for us now, for, for, for the situation in Malta now, to, to really have more legitimate consultation when it comes to these open spaces. Because often these, proje these projects, they are major projects, they are, they are government-led, and therefore, um, you know, we all have a stake as, 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 as a nation. We have a stake in them and therefore we should be enthusiastic about it. I remember, you know, you, do you remember way back when Citygate was being developed? There was this, this very big debate. People felt that this is their capital city and they had they had a say in that project and it was politicized. Um, you know, in a sense, why is this enthusiasm not being translated to when we develop open spaces, you know, when we create or, or, or when there is an opportunity uh, to do so? So um, I'm looking at some of the um, some of the chats over here, and um, we have. Um, so I'm, I'm I'm bringing in your chats. Uh, so um, I know people uh, are listening to us here, but please, if you would like to um, raise your hand, um, Sarah will uh, will bring you in, and um, please have your say. So uh, I will continue to monitor the the chat. However, for those who prefer to to jot down the comments, Caldon. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, this question about consultation and participation and being inclusive, um, uh, while really crucial in terms of like questioning what what do the, what do these terms mean? Um, I think they, however, um, uh, tend to look at government and the states as some sort of the only um, um, prime mover on these things in the sense that only the state can take initiative and therefore the state has a responsibility to be inclusive, to, 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 to be participatory in its processes and its policies, etc. cetera. Um, uh, and I think th there is, there is a, a, lot of, um, a lot of initiative that is taking place that is coming from civic society itself, where civic society itself is taking the lead position um, uh, and where uh, specifically NGOs are well they have been for decades now in Malta but but if now even more um are uh, are are bringing in proposals are taking um action themselves um including when it comes to greening when it comes to i don't know tree planting when it comes to preservation of public spaces also or as or aspects of the countryside or of the locality itself so i i think this is this is a really important dimension because it kind of galvanizes the desires and the frustrations and the, the wishes and the kind of everything that motivates people to, 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 to want to do something, um, um, but which, you know, for which often they do not find a channel to, to, to kind of, you know, to do something, um, not just voice their, mm -hmm. their concern. Um, and I think NGOs are, are absolutely crucial. The, the, there, there, there might be a risk, especially from us coming from the public sector, where if if it's not policy, if something is not policy driven, then the only alternative is to fall into some kind of nostalgic um, interpretation of a space before things became hyper regularized, um, and start thinking about how our villages were when there were no kind of traffic regulations and there were no, um, you know, ownership of public space. Everyone used to kind of stop their carts wherever they wanted in the square you know this kind of like almost wild west approach 
it's purely nostalgic and it's a, it doesn't it's, it's definitely not the automatic default if you remove policy today today i think the 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 counterbalance to policy should be civic structured civic society action which very often is channeled through ngos and and what maybe we don't have so much a culture of yet and and i think it it's really worth investing in is like neighborhood neighborhood bodies for example you know um organizations of of of, of residents that come to actually work on a very you know on a micro neighborhood project together yeah. provided with the tools from the local council or from central government or from from ngos because ngos also bring expertise you know but this type of like um um, a, a, a kind of collective action where you feel that your contribution has some meaning and it's making a difference and where you feel safe contributing and you can see also the immediate benefit for your own family and your own you know neighborhood mm -hmm. um, these are i think still a bit lacking because our ngos tend to work more on a national level or on mm -hmm. high profile projects or greening initiatives or whatever um, while these kind of initiatives on the micro level i think i don't know maybe policy can help again by creating these kind of tools to support the creation of these new platforms but i think it's a bit lacking and there's a lot a lot of potential there what do you think cynthia <laughs> okay so I, i'm wearing the hat of the ngo now um so yes continuing of um on, on what calzon was saying um as an ngo yes we are working on this so basically, because we are based um, at AMCAST in Paula, we work very closely with the, with the AMCAST community, with the students, young people, lecturers, and all this stuff there. And we created this initiative. It's, it's, um, we called it Cycle for Trees. So what we are doing is we are encouraging um, the students and lecturers to um, use um, alternative uh, modes of transport, mainly um, obviously cycling. Um, and then we are collecting their, um, the, the kilometers. They just send a, a screenshot of their, of their journey, basically. Um, and with every um, 250 kilometers, we are planting a tree at AMCAST. Well, the initiative is open to the general public public because we need more support. But this is like um, an initiative that it's it's not government funded. Um, it's an initiative in in uh, in collaboration with the with the AMCAST administration, with the students. And what is really nice about it is it it's it's not just that we are okay planting trees. But the students and uh, some lecturers were also involved in finding the location where where the trees are going to be planting planted. Sorry, um, like cleaning the areas, um, doing some general maintenance, choosing the right trees um, to plant. Um, um, there's an, a maintenance plan, so it's it's a bottom up approach basically. Um, we're not supported from the government nothing so it's it's basically all um it's the effort of of the students and the general public i must say um yeah i mean perhaps the, uh, perhaps this is um a, let's say a, a positive example of how um change can happen from 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 a bottom-up approach and not expecting the government and wait for the government to to provide perhaps the trees or to do something um well it's not straightforward of course there are a lot of challenges but but yeah i i i felt like i wanted to share what what we are doing at ambast this is to move isn't it yes it's it's, it's, well, it is it's true. true move and and um perhaps maybe i should also mention that the trees are supported also by the hsbc uh, foundation because obviously we do not have enough funding to also um, provide the trees. But let's say um, we're not just planting the trees, um, we're also helping the environment, um, encouraging um, students and staff to be more active. Um, uh, so, you know, it, it combines many things and it's a collective effort, which is very important because everyone feels part of this community, part of this initiative. So there might be 
might be people who, I don't know, cycle 10, just 10 kilometers, others who can cycle 200 kilometers in a month. It's okay, we, we pull up the kilometers and then we, we, we transform them into trees. Yeah. Uh, so we, we should be planting the trees at the end of February. That's, a, that's an amazing initiative. It shows the whole process no, of how people can really take action. I think um, I'm going to bring in Sarah here. So here has been, Sarah has been my, my silent co-host. But she's a you know has studied has researched um, open space and its implications. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to pick up on what um, uh, Caldam was saying and Cynthia actually on this idea of community, more community organizations working together in a more structured way. So, I mean, I think it's fantastic to see, you know, the initiatives which um, Cynthia is mentioning and to show how bottom up um, uh, initiatives and processes can help to, to create change. Um, but um, on top of this, sort of together with this, there are um, more what we call um, co-governance co approaches, right? So where you have maybe these community groups, which Caldon is working, working together with authorities. So where they are recognized and where there are frameworks then to support them. Um, and if we look um, at a lot of international case studies um, in this idea of, you know, green open space networks or green infrastructure or improving the quality, you know, of green open spaces, then they are really looking towards, because obviously, you know, these spaces need management, they need the aftercare maintenance. Then they are looking at ways of how, you know, they can facilitate actually community involvement um, and structure community involvement um, to help take care of these spaces. So this is, I think, is an important thing to mention. I mean, sometimes in some of the case studies I've read, um, all it's been is simply a letter of recognition you know, where the work that these, you know, groups of residents, what they were doing, you know, in this community gardening, for example, they were simply um, recognized and saying, you know, yes, we support this. And this then allowed them, for example, to continue to apply funding, to structure themselves, to continue moving forward, you know, so they know that this is, this is, this is okay. And they, and then obviously they can con continue contributing to um, taking care um, and improving the quality um, of, of our um, uh, green open spaces. Um, so I think this idea of co-governance, I just wanted to mention it, you know, as, as, as something that even as a, as, as, as a country that we can think of more in terms of a policy, you know, you were mentioning policy and asking about policy um, before Wendy uh, as well. Yes, I think here, I mean, it might be the time to bring up some challenges because um, you know, there is so much potential. I like that the conversation has taken us into the fact that um, we, you know, we, there is an, an urge, there is a need, it's recog a recognized need uh, for open spaces. Not only there's a recognized need for these open spaces to be co-designed and co-governed, you know, but there are challenges associated and maybe we could spend a few minutes um, you know, de debating such challenges. Um, I'm seeing a comment, a note here from Rafaela. Do we have an idea of the percentage area of green open spaces per locality? Um, is there a realization almost of, um, you know, optimal areas or um, optimal densities which would give rise to the need for open spaces? And therefore, there is a link almost between the morphology of the space and the policy and when that is supported by a bottom-up initiative, by the energy and the motivation, it is a very good symbiosis which might overcome the challenges of, of, of zoning uh, these open spaces. I don't know if any of you here, I'm going to include you in the discussion, Sarah, now. Um, uh, you know, are you- There, there was a study, mm -hmm. there was, back in when they were reviewing the, the structure plan, right? Um, and they were doing the topic papers, there was a review um, of um, trying to calculate per local council, the amount of open space. Usually it's per capita um, as a, you know, so it's uh, based on the on the population. So it's, it's per person. Um, uh, and, uh, but, but this data is now obviously quite old because this date dates back to the early 2000s. So, um, uh, and I believe as an average, they were trying to aim towards two square meters um, uh, to, to try and get to that. But if you look obviously at um, some of the goals um, or standards in a quantitative way now of trying of, of what, for example, other cities are aiming towards, they are obviously much higher. So I think while it's important to obviously have um, certain standards and, and goals to try and aim in a quantitative way, I don't think it's the only it's the only measure. And I don't think necessarily considering our size um, and density that you know we should necessarily focus on 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 um, what 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 I like to speak more about is actually um, 
are we within walking distance of an open space? So can we at least get to some sort of open space which we can use, even incidentally, even the smaller spaces, which Cynthia was mentioning, you know, the small activities, maybe you just stopped, you met a person, you had a coffee or you had a lunch break, you went out, you had a sandwich, you know, so even just small incidental spaces, and there may be, okay, some bigger ones, so even that we are within certain distances to a larger park or a larger garden. So these kind of um, measures can be introduced in, into policy where we at least try to have um, within a certain um, uh, walking distance, um, uh, a, a certain size of space or a certain functionality of space rather than trying to, 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 to compare to other cities um, because you know, then, then maybe we, we won't manage to get there. <laughs> it's all about even, sorry, Caldon, continue. No, no, I, I, I think the, the walkable distance is critical. Um, um, there's a, there, there is a dimension of social justice involved in uh, access to clean air, um, access to basic um, needs that, that feed into the well-being of a person. Um, and if you cannot reach a, a safe, well, if you cannot reach safely a safe, open, ideally green space, okay, within your neighborhood with your pushchair or with your walking stick, okay? Um, uh, then we are just leaving the, 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 the access to that resource to the people who can afford it because they can have their own private car and they can go to the countryside and, and enjoy it there, or they can afford to move home and buy a home in, in, a, in, a, in a, you know, with a garden or in a, in a kind of a green environment or whatever. So, or we're leaving it to the market to determine, you know, how much you have to pay to be able to access such spaces. And I think this is where the role of government becomes critical, mm -hmm. not now in the abstract of providing platforms, but actually of safeguarding the rights of people to actually access the very basic needs for them to live a wholesome life for them and their kids. And, 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 and this becomes kind of an active policy then. It becomes the counteraction to the dynamics of the market and of individualism. You know, where, where, where the public bodies take on the responsibility of ensuring that there is access, safe access to high quality open spaces for the community to enjoy. So I think that that is, I think, very important. And the walkable distance becomes really crucial because otherwise you're assuming that people have a car, people have um, resources, uh, people actually have the education to realize that they need that type of space, you know. It, it, it opens up all of these all of these issues. One of the questions that you put as a trigger for the panel when you asked us to do that was, made reference to lifestyle, okay? And how can green spaces support active, active lifestyles? And I mean, it really depends on what lifestyle can you afford, you know? So if, 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 if the lifestyle that you can afford is based on minimum wage, um, uh, then, uh, who is going to provide you with access to these kind of basic facilities? So uh, we have to be really careful here, I think. And it's, mm. and, and it's really going back to what should, um, what should the government do to ensure the basic, um, uh, basic um, quality of life for, for, for everyone. Lorraine in the chat, in fact, has made reference to fundamental human rights or you know, to, to, to live in a healthy environment. And this is something which you know, statutory institutions have a stake in to support. I look at it from a planner's perspective. So it's a question of prioritizing the zoning of open spaces over the zoning of other uses. Yes, and this brings us sort of full circle back to our, yes, what are our priorities in a sense? And this is a challenge. Um, this is, you know, in my mind, the key challenge, but I don't know what, what, what other people think. It's um, the realization of, and that realization, you know, filtering up from the grassroots to the, the decision makers, to, 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 to the politicians. This filtering up of this, yes, we want these spaces, we need these spaces because it is a human right, you know, um, it, it will support our health, uh, both physical and psychological. Bernardine, you want to come in here? We... Um, 
of these studies that I conducted with my colleague, Therese Bayada. We, we asked people during the COVID period um, when, when there were um, aspects in, in relation to um, not being able to go out um, in relation to this type of lockdown. Um, and the people who mostly were suffering from a decrease, a, a, a severe decrease in their well-being, were those living in highly urban spaces, lacking green or, or any type of open space. So, so those were the people who were mostly experiencing this, together with what also Calden um, pointed out, those who were employed in risky type of employment, or low um, wage type of employment. And therefore, these two groups of people, those living in highly urbanized neighborhoods and those with um, a low wage type of employment were the groups mostly who experienced a sudden decrease in their well-being. Their well-being was already not optimal, but then with the lockdown and with, with the changes that they could not go out, they could not see this the sky when they wake up because they, some of the apartments are designed and the housing conditions that does not provide you the opportunity to, to see any form of nature. And therefore, this was very harmful for their mental well-being mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. possibly also their physical as well. Mm -hmm. Very much so. I mean, it's, it's all linked to the stress no? that, that, that we feel. Um, Cynthia, would you like to say something maybe of your experiences with your experience with working with communities and whether throughout the pandemic you have seen a shift in people, you know, really starting to demand uh, a better lifestyle through more open spaces? Has there been a shift in the pandemic or will we go back to a normal that was uh, once our normal or will we achieve maybe a, a, a better normal? Well, yes, in, in fact, um, during the pandemic, I was very happy to see a lot of people walking and, and doing some sort of exercise outside. Um, you know, some, some streets and spaces, uh, whereas before you, you didn't see anyone or, you know, we used to see, but really a good number of people. And because I cycle a lot, um, we were finding it difficult, you know, to 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 cycle through uh, through some parts. But that's okay; it's it's fine. Um, again, which going back to our argument, there is a need, and I think that the people were that people were going more outside and walking more and doing this some sort of exercise. First of all, because I believe they had more time, um, because. Perhaps many were working from home, um, they were driving less, and also because of, of their well-being. Um, so unfortunately, well, with things getting back to some sort of normal, I can see a decrease in, in such activities. But again, when we uh, discuss with, let's say, with students, because again, because we work with students, but also with, with the general public, um, something that really frustrates me is that sometimes we tend to say, okay, because the Maltese are lazy, because we don't want to walk, people, you know, are, are just use cars. It's true, but do we have other alternatives? Is, are there any options? I mean, I don't use a car. I cycle a lot. I try to walk a lot, but it's because of my background. Unfortunately, unfortunately for many others, they need a little bit more of a push, they want to feel safe, they, they want to have a nice environment where they can walk, just as we were talking at the beginning. So yes, there is a need. And I feel that if there is this change, even they don't have to be like big projects, even like small greening projects, safe streets, um, eventually the people will use them. Um, and there will be change, but we need to start I believe it's it's more a bottom up approach um, and 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 educational campaigns about the uh, positive impact of of just a simple walk. So there is more demand for these spaces, and hopefully then start change starts to happen from a bottom up rather than a top down. Um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to, to see how 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 this will unfold eventually. 
it's it's I'm sure it's been a personal experience for most. I mean, even my myself speaking personally, I somehow something clicked in my head and I simply started appreciating more the value of, of this clean air and having you know a good path. And I, I tried to look for opportunities to walk instead of to drive. Uh, you know, and obviously we are aware of the challenges associated with that, even even challenges in our heads, uh, the, the perception of what is walking distance, for example, is something which I've personally battled with. What do I do? I consider walking to the nearest bakery walking distance or or not. Um, so it's been a, you know, a, a, a personal transformation. It takes time. It takes time. I don't know if there's anyone who is attending here who would like to speak of an experience. Um, that there is some some time for us. We have uh, at least fifteen minutes for us to you know share experiences, if you like. So, um, uh, Rafaela, I'm, I, see, I see here. Yes, Rafaela would like raised to raise her hands and, and. All right, let's let's open uh, Rafaela. She said she has a toddler, but <laughs> Rafaela, would you like to speak? Hello. Hi, good evening. Moni. Eva. Kevin, how are you? <laughs> um, you have had many experiences in this oh, regard, I'm sure. Yes. Um, I mean, I'm, obviously, I'm enjoying the uh, hearing you all out, and I'm interested in, in Sarah and, and your, your research. Um, uh, just some points I, I would like to mention. Um, uh, obviously, um, certain localities have definitely more um, uh, faced more more difficulties um, because of their um, uh, their geography, their their situation. Um, uh, so sometimes I think we need to look at extreme cases um, like. For example, um, Birkirkara, which is a, a, an area of interest um, for me, um, where uh, there are um, uh, there are initiatives to try and and find pockets of of uh, public spaces. Um, however, considering the population density, it's definitely not enough. Um, there's also um, uh, when w when I we're, we're talking here on uh, green public space. Um, however, I, I I in certain cases I I would open it up to public space in general. So, for example, um, uh, pavement, um, the um, uh, uh, the conflict between cars and pedestrians. Um, conflict between um, tables and chairs, restaurants and, and pedestrians, um, yes. the need for, for um, shared spaces. Um, so, I mean, uh, again, we, we, I suggest that, that things are, are uh, looked into um, from holistically. Um, and definitely um, uh, from a grassroots um, uh, perspective. Um, uh, I've encountered situations where um, uh, th there are local authorities, um, government authorities that carry out um, a greening initiative. Um, however, the community doesn't um, take it up, basically ignores, ignores it, leaves it. Um, as a derelict place um, because of our culture, of our uh, partisan um, culture. Um, yes. So definitely the benefit of having a truly grassroots uh, community-led approach, um, I think needs to be stressed. Mm -hmm. Um. Uh, Lorraine, would you would you like to to, to share something? Hi, um, nice meeting you. <laughs> um, I think I missed the first part, but obviously all valid points, and and I think you touched basically on mania and everything. But I think at times as a as a citizen, I feel that um, either the urgency of these spaces is not understood by the government because 
these are things they became very critical. I were okay. The fact that a lot of um, houses are even having their gardens being demolished, all replaced by one ground floor mezzanine, and everyone has they have a small mes like balcony. I think they should. I don't know. There needs to be, I think, some change in every aspect in in planning. In and I think either we're not all working together. Something is not working. You know, like more innovation habits needs to change even before people are ready to do it. There's a lot that can be done. Like our rights, our rights for a good lifestyle. I think this. I don't know what to call it. There's things happening. We can't say things haven't changed, but I'm sure, for example, I don't know, this week I thought about having a road in every locality where people walk, not just in a, like a piazza or whatever. They can just walk even, and then you connect it from one location to the other, and you can walk maybe throughout the island on through this part. I just crossed my mind this week, but we can do it maybe at the minute. At, at the moment, just in the co coast road or in countryside, but why can't it happen from, I don't know, inside the, throughout the locations? It's just maybe it, it doesn't make sense. It, it doesn't, it can't happen in reality, but these are things that I'm sure there's a lot that can be discussed and, you know, happen. So I feel it, at times it frustrates me that we're not just doing them, you know, these should be top priorities, I think, at the minute. There's no excuse, and I think they just have to happen, but. I don't know why there seem to be always an excuse to stop it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. On a bigger scale, that's all I want to say. Sarah, I know we've discussed this before. So. <laughs> no, in fact, I just wanted to buy very quickly because I, I want the, the Stephen who wants to speak. Um, yeah, I want to make reference to the position paper so that if people are interested, you know, they can, you know, look up. There is the summary online. And um, it, I think here what um, uh, Rafaela was also touching up on and now Lorraine is it's important, the different types of open spaces. Yes. So, yes, there are the pocket parks. Yes, there are the bigger spaces and streets are crucial. And one of the typologies um, which we mentioned in the position paper is this idea of a green loop, where within a locality we try and find like streets which are slightly wider or, or can, you know, where we can introduce vegetation and trees and create like a loop, which can be like, you know, a route for walking within the locality where you are connecting these, these streets. And this is something which I had read in literature where um, it was saying basically, yes, in most urban areas, we probably don't have large enough green spaces where we can go for a walk, a, a jog and a walk every day. And it's interesting. It remains fun because they're just not big enough. We don't have those big parks. So if we had to create these, you know, loops within our, our through our streets, within our um urban areas, then we could have that, you know, it could facilitate active lifestyles in, in that sense. So um, that, that's all I wanted to mention. Maybe we can move on to the other people who have their hands all raised. Yes, and we Steve. have Steve and Joaquim and Rafael. So please, Steve. Hi, good evening. Can everyone hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Hi. Hi, good evening. So first, I think I just want to bring two points. So one was uh, what the discussion was earlier. So the importance of NGOs kind of pushing is the Sorry, this is the comment that I wrote in the chat, but mm -hmm. I believe it's quite um, important. I believe wholeheartedly the importance of NGOs basically to push the bar forward, but eventually they're going to bump into a limit. Now that limit could either be, you know, if there's an NGO that wants to take back the space from cars, they can't go remove car parking and plant trees where there are cars because They'll be stopped by the police, the planning authority, by people, et cetera, et cetera. So again, this, this idea of co-creation, co so it being with the public and with NGOs, I believe first has to begin from the government at wide kind of agreeing that this is what where we want to take the direction of our of our open space. Oh, yeah, you know, open space in general. And just my second point is this this lovely oxymoron that I hear from everyone is that there's no space for open space, which I think is always great and perfect. But I think we can just all see that there is space. So this is, I believe, also kind of bouncing off what um, Sarah just mentioned now of how we can look at our, our streets as a type of open space. And especially when, I don't know if you ever care to do it, if you walk in a street at around 1 a.m., 
you'll see all the open space that we have. You'll see all the parked cars and all of the open space basically taken up by taken up by the car. So yeah, I just I, I I just think it's really nice when whenever I hear people saying that there's no space for open space. You've Thank inspired you. me to go out walking at one a.m. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Joaquim, would you like to, and then there's, there's Rafael as well. Rafael, would you like to, I know you, you. Oh yeah, yeah. Sh 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 Hi. Yeah, sure. Um, hello. Um, nice to see you here. Yeah. Yeah. Good to see you. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, the comment about where to find the space for this uh, for these green spaces um, in the Toronto, uh, sorry, in the in the Malta archives, I found an, a map from 1944 showing all the publicly owned land, and it's largely military um, properties, but there are other properties as well. And and just for fun, I, I went into Photoshop and I the publicly owned land was in red. And I changed it to green to envision what it would look like if those um, land assets, which were there for the safety and security of Malta, from a military perspective, if those were translated to, you know, safety and well-being from a from a kind of from an environmental perspective. And the fact is, there is a lot of uh, of this um, military, you know, old military land, much of which is still underused and. Uh, if we start to look at, at green space, well, not start, but if we if we recognize green space more as a question of infrastructure, which is essential, um, then um, we could, you know, intensify the usefulness of, of our spaces by having some of these spaces which are currently exclusively heritage monuments and, and kind of make them into more powerful spaces that have a, a heritage story to tell, but they also play uh, a role in terms of public space and a uh, natural space. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so when you look at the map, I, I, I digitized several figure grounds where you have, you know, black and white, and you try and bring in different colors to better visualize what space you have. It's almost like Steve's 1 a.m. walk, where you actually visualize the space, just the amount of space, and we, we you kind of start losing this idea of, well, it's a small island, there isn't enough space for open space. Um, you know, but there is the space. It's just a question of priorities, mm. really. So I don't know, Joaquim. Um, I, I couldn't hear you before. Uh, hi. Whether... hi, sorry. Hi. Can hi. I? Hi, can I be heard? Sorry, I had my oh, microphone yes, yes. on the on the other side. Um, I, I'm just going to play a bit, a bit the devil's advocate, I guess, to some extent here, because we were talking about the importance of consultation, about listening to the people. But we're also talking about bubbles and we're talking about as well an environment where there is, you know, NGOs that are speaking in favor of, say, for example, cycle lanes, say, for example, open spaces. But there is obviously, we live in a period, in a time, I guess, where the establishment seems to be not that, or at least. I mean, the view that there needs to be open spaces, more walkable places, to me, it appears to be a growing view, but it's still quite a minority view. So in a sense, the, I think, and I've, I've spoken to these people many times who passionately, with great fervor, would tell you that trees have no place on streets, that open spaces have no value, and that they should be turned into parking spaces because that is what they value. They want the parking spaces. The tree is a threat because it's a, a peril in their path. Um, the, they, they value the car over that, and that comes maybe from that culture, that, that, that late 20th century culture of pro-car use, for, for example. But so, so we've got, we are here, we're all speaking about, you know, um, you know, the importance of open spaces, importance of trees, importance of having, you know, uh, comfortable footpaths or that you encourage people to walk the, the, and all of these things. And we, we are obviously talking in a bubble and in, in many ways, I can't hear anyone discussing against such arguments. 
So when it comes to public consultation, I mean, it, I think it, it was mentioned as well. And I've been in public consultations where I was prepared with all these beautiful arguments. And all I could hear is people questioning, where is the parking? Where is the parking? And this is not local. This was a, a this was a foreign. This I was working in the UK, and the, that's the only question. I, I can't. That was the only question. There was no other questions coming from other people. Where is the parking? Where is the parking? So in a sense, where how the, the, there is you know ample papers now, growing number of papers that are making the importance of open spaces, trees, and things like that. How do you reconcile the fact that when you go to public consultations, the the answer is generally against all of this that we're currently currently kind of discussing? So then, what is the value of consultation? What are we getting it from it? If, for example, as a policymaker, we are putting an emphasis on these things, and we're hearing these comments from people, and we are going to actively, I guess, ignore them. Because we're saying, you know, uh, you know, a uh, hundred people told us that they need parking here. But really, if we're going to put parking here, we're not going to have space for anything else. So we're ignoring those hundred people because those have given the wrong answer. We want, we want open space. We want guts. We want the tree. We want trees. We want. How, what, in a sense, this is my question. How are we, I mean, obviously, we, we, in this regard, we are kind of giving more value to certain things that kind of, to certain opinions that match what we are, what all studies are telling us. So that is fine. But, but then, again, what is the value of consultation if we are ignoring that 60%, say, for example, of people who are have opinions that we know that are not of benefits for them, but isn't which is a bit of a patronizing view to some extent. But many studies are saying that, and in so in the sense, what the 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 really what is the this is my question? What is the value of public consultation in this regard when there is these diametrically opposed opinions in the public? You're bringing us to the question of legal versus legitimate of democracy, you know, that we mentioned before, you know, um, everyone has a voice and therefore, you know, how to sift through those voices. And this is the role of policy. This, you know, I, I worked at the planning authority and for me, this was one of the most interesting aspects of my role there, you know, of sifting through the voices to, to, to achieve policy. I'm afraid we're going to have to uh, close off uh, our, our session today. It's been immensely interesting, but I want to give our panelists uh, one, one final say, and then we will, we will wrap up to be continued. So we, we uh, yes, Sarah, I'll give you the last word. Uh, no, I will give the panelists the last word, <laughs> but I did want to um, uh, just comment uh, because I don't want to leave it like open ended on, the, on this, um, you know, what 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 Joachim was saying. Um, I think it's an important point that he raised this issue of parking, but I also think it's like a step by step um, process, you know. So there are there are solutions, um, and I think we should we, we do listen um, to to the people and we say, okay, yes, there is a need for parking at the moment, but because that is our that is our lifestyle and our current way of movement but there are ways to provide so there, there could be better parking management um, and we can reinterpret those those needs we can say okay but it doesn't have to be here the parking we can maybe organize it in a better way so that maybe we can still you know shift our parking off street have better parking management to create that public that public space and then slowly while we're improving the situation for being able to walk or being to have more um, provide for other um, active mobility, then maybe slowly, slowly we can reduce, you know, or change our hab habits um, in terms of, of, of mobility. So I think it's a step by step process where we listen to, to, to people and then we try obviously to find um, what the others, but it's it's definitely a valid point that this is something that comes out. Um, but I think this is also one of the scopes of this um, of this platform, in a sense, no? So we mentioned in the very beginning that, you know, we're seeing more of a demand 
for green open spaces. And that's where we have to start the demand. Um, somebody yeah. mentioned the need to create awareness and that is as well. And that is as well what we are doing, you know, um, through discussions. And then slowly that can trigger um, more, more, more demand. Um, so hopefully, eventually we will not um, be speaking in a bubble or at least that is the vision. <laughs> we will not be <laughs> in this bubble, but this bubble will, will become bigger. Because this is this is a real obviously challenge the the, the questions which 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 Joachim um, raised. So, but I will now uh, pass. I'm sure the other panelists have the question have, of actionable policy. You know, how do you, you know, how do you sift through the voices to form a way forward, which is in the public interest, and that public interest is a very elusive uh, phenomenon. But let's start wrapping up. So, uh, Bernardine, would you like to? Uh, start our, our our concluding comments i can be heard now good right um can i can i connect a bit with um joachim's comment um when i was conducting a project with children in relation to green open spaces and we did the consultation also with the local council um the local council's first response was but we need that space for parking and then um, they were pointing out, but we are also valuable. And then he pointed out, um, not as valuable as adults. So, so children are a minority group. Let's, let's, let's call them like that. And one of the children told him, I need to vote in four years time. So think about what you decide. And I think um, that was the right answer because sometimes it is also a matter of how much we push the public to um, to instigate a change um, and therefore this appreciation of, of the aesthetic beauty of the therapeutic um, landscapes, how much um, it is important for our sense of pride, for our sense of place, for our love of place, um, in order not cr to create um, aspects of inequality in, in comparison of one neighborhood to the other. Um, if one neighborhood has green open spaces and connected walkable open spaces in comparison to another neighborhood, um, in that manner we are creating aspects of inequality. And therefore I think um, there is the need of uh, understanding and knowledge of the importance of conservation of certain open spaces, pockets, big parks, accessibility, etc. Because they are um, highly important for, for people. And the more we understand their value, um, the more hopefully um, the people who value the car will decrease and, and those who value um, public green and blue open spaces increase. I love your positivity, Bernadine. We need to speak more. <laughs> Cynthia. Okay, I'm unmuted. Um, well, uh, very well said, Bernadine. I, I totally agree. Um, also, maybe to, to connect a bit with, with the participants' interventions. Um, yes, um, perhaps we should be inspired a bit, bit with what Paris is, is, is doing at the moment. And um, maybe participants um, have time to um, uh, Google a bit. There are very inspiring um, videos of how actually the, the residents, they, they didn't want the, um, uh, the interventions. Um, they didn't want the, the cycling paths. They just wanted to continue using their, their cars and parking spaces. But eventually, um, um, and it was a, a hard struggle, I must say. But eventually, um, with the, because of the pandemic, one day they they kind of realized that having a safe um, safe paths to walk or to cycle it was wow um, a sigh of relief because they didn't need to go to use public transport, um, uh, which was less safe considering the situation. And so slowly, bit by bit, more people started to cycle. And now, I mean. I think they removed most of the parking spaces in, in Paris. It's a walkable city um, and the people are happy. But obviously it took a couple of years, I believe around 15 years. Um, and these things um, take time, but we, we, have to, we have to start somewhere. 
And another thing I would like to mention is, um, I believe it was Rafaela who mentioned that there are localities that maybe they lack these open spaces. So maybe we should consider also involving like the schools, for example, in Birkirkara, I know there's Salanwiji, they have a, a beautiful open space, a garden. So maybe we should also look at involving um, involving the school so that they can leave these spaces open. I, I, I'm not familiar with, with the opening times and how, how they work, but maybe they should also be part of, of these open open spaces, of these green pockets, given that obviously Birkirkara, for example, is so densely populated and the school is, let's say, it's perceived as a safe, as a safe, um, as a safe space. Um, another thing I would like to add is maybe um, we should, it's time to start looking at something more tangible, provide more tangible uh, data on how these spaces actually um, are, are a source of health. And if we provide, if we have some sort of tangible data that we can provide to the government, to the policymakers, on how much they would save on, let's say, health, um, health budget because more people are walking because more people are, are are healthy perhaps they will start to rethink and invest more in these spaces and realize the uh, the potential of these spaces and we know that our I mean not our but politicians and the government talks in numbers and if we don't provide these numbers they will never understand um, you know if we, if we never understand these figures um, they will never actually understand or try to engage in some sort of conversation. So somehow, yes. you know, I know it's a bit, you know, um, to quantify this, is, it's a little bit difficult. But again, I, I believe we have to start somewhere because once we provide the figures to our government, okay, then, um, you know, they would realize the, the potential benefit of these, of these spaces. I think your experience shines through here. Um, your years of experience in lobbying for these for these <laughs> yeah I must say I'm good at that <laughs> Caldon any final any final comment from you um uh, well I mean it's difficult to escape um, Joachim's question you know um uh, because the the car is the elephant in the room when it comes to public spaces um and the thing is that when when uh, when people react to projects, to you're breaking up, Caldon. The connection lasted for a good hour and a half, but uh, we've lost him now. While Caldon is trying to reconnect, um, may I just say that um, this webinar is part of a series and that we also intend on holding workshops um, because Adaura Madwarna is essentially a think tank, is a group of people coming together to debate such issues. And um, for those of you who need, do need to make the way, I know we have run over by a quarter of an hour, please get in touch with us on info at dauramadwarna.org. And we'd be, you know, we usually meet up with people, we'll have a chat and, you know, slowly we'll form a team and get to know each other and uh, really, you know, push forward the idea of collaborating and uh, towards, you know, making, making what we've been speaking of a reality. I love how this, this webinar today took on a really positive note. And although we debated challenges and real life experiences, it, 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 it's given me a feel good factor, you know, and that there's a group of people who do believe in, 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 in the way forward. Caldon, are you back with us? Yes, we can see you. Can you hear me as well? Yes, yes, yes. Sorry, for some reason, exactly when I started speaking, everything froze. Um, no, so very briefly, um, no, I, I, uh, I don't know um, um, where, where it actually um, um, cut off, but um, I, the, the problem with certain projects is that the only point of contact they have with the, the you know the real lives of people is that they affect them by by impact them impacting on their on their parking possibilities that's their only point of contact so that's why the reason the, you know very 
well, there are other impacts that they would have. So I, I would ask, where are the other projects? You know, where are the projects that We've lost you again, Caldon. Let's see if we, we manage to get you back. In the meantime, I'm posting on the chat um, our email address. So info at dauramadwarna.org. I need to make sure that I wrote dauramadwarna correctly. No, we seem to have... Uh, Yes, Caldon, are you back with us? Okay, you are back. Yes, but it's it seems to be on and off again. So maybe you can just try switching off your camera for the concluding to see if that helps the um, We no. can hear you. Okay. No, just, just to conclude that I think there's a lot of potential already with the existing open spaces that that are being underutilized. Um, uh, and, and that I think the way forward is by looking at neighborhoods rather than at national projects, by looking at kind of, you know, again, again the walkable distance and then joining the dots, you know, but making mm -hmm. an impact on real lives of real people that are living in certain areas. So that to make sure that, you know, when we speak about quality of life, we're not speaking in the abstract, but in, in concrete terms, um, in, in terms of something relatable for people to, 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 to feel that they are being impacted positively and that they actually can contribute by maintaining those spaces, co-governance in, in terms of those spaces, um, uh, etc. So I think working on the micro neighborhoods is better than working on a kind of larger uh, national level, unless that national le level means you know, turning our direction 180 degrees when it comes to our transport policy and looking at, you know, different ways of, of, of addressing, addressing uh, mobility issues and, 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 and the wider kind of environmental issues. Yes, I think uh, concluding on that note, Caldon, you've given us a perfect, you know, full circle in, you know, let us focus on, 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 on the grassroots. Let us focus on people mm -hmm. who are already motivated to do things in the public interest and 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 to work towards uh, the greater good i think you've given all bernardine caldon cynthia you've uh, sarah too and all our uh, participants are like in these i mean personally i'm very inspired to as to our next webinars we keep in touch i'm going to close off uh, here because we've run over we'll be in touch with our next um webinar with uh, a date and time um also if you want to email us if you're interested in workshopping with us we have some great people on board to to make it fun so um thank you for being here thank you for spending the evening with us and we look forward to seeing you again bye bye have a good evening